Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Teleshadowing. We are live on YouTube. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat box as we go along and they will be addressed. I'm honored to introduce our mentor for today, Dr. Tarek Mohammed, who will be returning with us um, for a second year um, in a row. He's with us last year, actually, for um, ophthalmology as well. Um, Dr. Mohammed is currently a fellow now of, vitri of vitreo retinal surgery at the University of Iowa. He completed his ophthalmology residency at the University of Maryland, where he served as a chief resident. He's known by many to be a kind and talented mentor as well as a leader. He completed medical school at the New York University, and he received his undergraduate degree from the Johns Hopkins University. Now it is my honor to request Dr. Tarek to begin today's session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me back. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to be here. And you know, I definitely want to keep you all involved. So whatever questions you have, like she was said, like I mean, was saying, just type in the chat box, or if you raise your hand, uh, or whatever, whatever you feel comfortable doing to to interrupt me. Um, so. Let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> so I'll break this up into a couple of different things. Um, I think what's helpful in shadowing is two things. You don't want to actually see the day-to-day -day of, of what you know ophthalmologists do. Um, but before I get to that, I want to talk a little bit about my, my path towards medicine. Um, and so I my understanding is many of you are in college or sort of uh, maybe just finished or about to start. Um, and I know some of you are about to start medical school. Uh, so I'll focus more on that um, part of my training. Um, just so you have some ideas of the things I was thinking about and the things I was doing. Um, and then after we talk about that, then I'll talk about ophthalmology itself. And, and again, the first part of that will be more of instructive, you know, some of the anatomy of the eye and some of the diseases, just so you get an idea of the type of things we treat and the type of patients we see. Um, and then after that, I'll get to more of the details of what it actually is like day to day being an ophthalmologist and, you know, what you would see if you were shadowing in person. Um, and then I'll close with, I have a couple of different surgical videos. We'll see how much we have time to show. Um, but again, when I was shadowing an ophthalmologist, which is something I did you know, early on, I was fortunate to have that opportunity. Um, seeing the surgery was kind of one, of the, one of the coolest things I ever saw. And I, I was really, um, that really stuck with me. And it's still something I remember to this day. So hopefully you all can have some of that. Um, so as uh, as was mentioned, this is my my background here. So when I was an undergrad or when I was starting college, you know, the first question is, what do you want to study um, and where do you want to go? And so you want to think about, and, and the way I answer that question and the way I sort of thought about all the different steps is not just, you know, what am I going to do after this, but what am I going to do five, 10 years from this? So when I thought about, you know, what I wanted to study, I wanted to study something that gave me all the different options of the areas that I wanted to do as a career. Um, so studying biomedical engineering gave me the option of studying, in, of, you know, being an engineer, doing scientific research, and also going to medical school, which for me were the different things I thought about, the different areas I've shadowed, um, and done some research in and said, you know, these are the things I think I would like to do. So let me pick something to study that will give me all those uh, opportunities to, to pursue. Um, the other thing, and this will kind of be repeated over the course, is you want to find an overlap of things that you like and things that you're good at. And then also, mo most importantly, things that would be helpful, you know, to help the community around you. Um, so all those things I mentioned, like, you know, studying engineering or doing scientific research or being in medicine were things that I enjoyed. Um, things that I had done well in earlier on, um, but also things that I could see myself, you know, helping the community. Um, and I think finding the overlap of those things for you, which is going to be different from everyone, um, will help you narrow down, really start to get an idea of, of things you'd like to do long term. So uh, after I went to, um, during my last year of, of university, I, I did some ophthalmology research and I did some engineering research. So I did the engineering research actually last, I did the ophthalmology stuff first. Um, just based on my schedule and, and, you know, the people I was talking with at the time. So, you know, when you're studying in college, I think some of the things you can do to help yourself figure out what you want to do and also prepare yourself for the following steps. Um, and that will also help you with your applications and everything is to try to really develop, try to develop mentors early on. Um, and the way you do that, there's a couple of different ways to do that. You know, your, all of your teachers are at academic institutions because they like being at academic places. And that means they like to teach and they like to do research and they like to be mentors to trainees like you. So, you know, when you're at a big university or any university, you know, you have to take advantage of those opportunities by if there's someone who's teaching a class or gives you a lecture that you really enjoy and you find is a, is a topic that you would want to know more about, um, to send them a message, you know, come up to them after class, you know, they may say, you know, they're too busy or they don't have time. But in my experience, most of the people if you talk to them, they'll be very happy to try to talk with you, even if it's a one-time thing and it's not a long-term, 
you know, relationship, you still can benefit from that and learn from them and get mentoring opportunities. And that is doubly important because the kinds of people you establish mentors with, you know, they're going to help you figure out what you want to do and expose you to different areas of uh, different career opportunities. Um, but they're also the ones who have connections with other people in, in similar areas. You can get your internships, um, jobs. And then if you're going to be applying to medical school or some kind of graduate school, they're the, they're the people who will also be able to write your strong letters for recommendation and may have connections in that particular field as well. So it's a very useful um, thing. And that was not something I actually took advantage of as much as I, I think I should have. So that's one of the things I want to emphasize today. Um, so uh, the other thing that's useful is the things that you think you want to do is to actually spend time in that area. Because, you know, what I thought medicine was before I started and what I thought ophthalmology was before I started is very is different than what, it, what I know it is now. Um, having done it for a while. And some of that is unavoidable. You know, you're not really going to know what something is until you do it for real. Um, but you want to spend as much time talking with people for their perspective, but also trying to really imagine yourself in that role, you know, shadowing, or even in the case of, you know, if you can do like a, a project or a, some sort of research in that area to really imagine and visualize what it would be like for you to be doing that for 10, 15, 20 years, then that will help you decide if it's the right field for you or not. So that's what I did when I was an engineer. You know, I studied um, biomedical engineering. I was working in a uh, mechanical engineering lab or a design studio working on some rehabilitative devices. And I really enjoyed it. You know, I loved doing the, the engineering part of it, That I, but I, I didn't like that we couldn't see our product being used and we couldn't, you know, really talk to people who would benefit from it. So that's what pulled me more towards medicine. So at that point, I decided to apply to medical school um, and we can... If it's helpful, later on, we can talk more about some of the details and things about that. Um, but I went to med school at NYU, and I was very fortunate early on. Same thing. I was trying to find the overlap of things I liked and things I was good at and things that I thought would help people. Um, and then also trying to find good mentors. And I was very fortunate to find a good mentor early on in ophthalmology, um, really by, by just good luck. And he turned out to be a retina specialist, which is one of the things I ended up doing later on. Uh, and he, just as I was saying before, he knew a lot of people, he gave me a lot of good advice, and then he ended up, you know, supporting me in my application, I'm still in touch with him. So, again, the importance of early mentorship is cannot be overstated. So I decided to go into ophthalmology. Now, I want to break this down just real quick, because I know some of this is unfamiliar to some people, it was definitely unfamiliar to me when I was applying. So what, you know, what is medical training really like? Well, after med school, you know, that's really the start of your training. Once you finish med school, you're not really, you know, you don't really feel comfortable doing anything by yourself. And you, in, in the U.S., there's a very formalized way of training, which is nice in a lot of ways because you feel comfortable after you finish it. It's very organized and you learn really what you need to learn. I learned more in residency, I feel like, than I have in, you know, all the years prior. And I felt comfortable being an ophthalmologist, which is really important. I think, you know, some other types of training, you may not feel comfortable once you finish your degree and you may have to seek out some training on your own. So for ophthalmology, you do one year of general medicine, um, and then you do three years of ophthalmology. And then at that point, you know, if you wanted to open your own practice or join a practice, you know, academic or private, you can do that. And um, if you did not want to, and you wanted to subspecialize, which is what I chose to do, and what about half of ophthalmologists choose to do, you're going to do, do an additional one or two years in training um, in a certain area. And I'll go through some of the areas when we talk about the anatomy, I'll go through kind of the different areas of ophthalmology. Um, both to cover the types of disease we treat, but also to cover the different types of careers. Um, the training for fields outside of ophthalmology generally is similar. You know, for other sort of subspecialty surgeries, you have to do your general training, and then you do, you know, three to five or seven sometimes years of residency-specific training. And then some some fields, it's more common to do fellowships, some it's not. But in general, you can train, you can start practicing once you finish your residency, but the residencies, of course, are very lens. You have to decide for residency you, you apply for that in your last year of medical school. Um, this is unrelated to the rest of the talk, but, you know, previously I was talking about research and mentors and applications and all that stuff. And you definitely want to do well in school and do well on your tests and all those things to help you do well. Um, but I think it's important for your own personal benefit uh, to have things outside of work that keep you happy and healthy um, from a physical health, mental health, spiritual health perspective. Um, so you, I would encourage you, and I'm sure all of you have do this to some degree in, in different areas, you know, do some kind of athletic, physical health uh, activity, do something that's creative and do things that you, you know, that are relaxing, that you enjoy, that you can, you know, do social things or, you know, if you're more of an introvert, more things that you do by yourself. 
Um, and these, you know, I do, whatever you do, I think you should try to do it well. Um, and that doesn't mean that you have to be like the best at it, but you should do it. If you enjoy it, you're going to want to do a lot of it and you're going to become, you know, you're proficient at it. And I bring that up because, you know, when you're applying for med school or other things, you know, these are the things that often come up, you know, on your application, everyone, most people are going to have, you know, good grades, good test scores, good letters of recommendation, or are going to have, you know, a, a pretty good academic background. Um, but what makes you unique are the things that you like to do that, you know, other people may not like to do. And these are things you can talk about in your interview, you can put on your application, um, and they help you stand out. And I'm not saying you should do them because they do that, but I'm saying that's a, you know, kind of a, a benefit of doing them. You should do them because they help take care of you. And you're going to need these kinds of activities to help get through some of the tough days, you know, as you, as you progress through your training. Um, so again, make sure you establish this early on, you know, if you're in college, it's a great time to do it. A lot of people, you know, once you start med school or once you start, you know, you, you kind of give up these things and, you know, you might have to tone them back a little bit, but you shouldn't give them up. You know, if you like doing it, you should make time to do it. And, it, you know, you only get busier as you go along. You know, I'm definitely busier now than I've ever been. And, you know, you have to make time to do them when you're less busy and you have more control over your schedule because they become habits. And once they're a habit, then they, you know, they can kind of support you the rest of your career. So that's the uh, sort of intro on my background in how I got to where I am. Um, I'm, I'm really only a couple of weeks into my fellowship here, so I, I won't talk too much about that because I, I don't have much experience in it yet. Um, so we'll transition to ophthalmology, you know, some of the basics in terms of anatomy. And, you know, there's not, this is, this is just for your understanding of what ophthalmologists do and the kind of things we treat, because again, I didn't know much about ophthalmology before I started it. And I, I didn't really know what ophthalmologists did. Um, and then afterwards, we'll get to some of the surgical videos, which will kind of show some of this anatomy in practice. Um, again, if you have questions, type them in the chat box. I'm happy to answer them as we go. So this is a picture of the eye. We'll sort, sort of start from the outside and go in, which I think is a common way of learning ophthalmology. And also when we examine patients in clinic, you know, how we examine, we look at kind of at their whole face and how they're looking around and we check their vision and those kinds of things. Um, and then we look at the area around the eye, like the eyelids, and we check how their eyes move, which is all stuff around the eye. And then we look inside the eye with, you know, special lights and lenses. And I'll show a picture of that in a second. So this is what the eye would look like if you were looking from the top down. This is the left eye. And, uh, you know, we're looking, this, this is normally blocked by the skull, you know, it's someone's head. So from the top down in the back here, can you, I hope you can see my mouse, but on the right side of the screen, is where the nerves are, and these nerves connect to the brain. So the brain, you know, which has three, four, and six with Roman numerals, those really connect to the brain, which is over in this area on the right side of the screen. And then, you know, the eyeball is in the front of the face, as you as you know. Um, some of the structures in the back of the eye, these nerves help control the eye movement, um, which is very important. If, if they don't function right, and your eye isn't moving properly, then you'll have double vision, um, and you won't be able to move your eye. You know, your eyes need to be able to keep aligned so that things, you get stereo vision in all fields of view. So if you look to the right, you see things in stereo. If you look to the left, you see things in stereo. If your eyes don't move properly in a coordinated way, um, which is, you know, very finely controlled, um, then you'll have double vision. And so the other nerves, like this one that says five at the bottom, goes and helps control a lot of sensation around the eye as well. So, if, you know, your eye is a very sensitive area, and that's because, you know, there are nerves that go from the front of the eye all the way back to the brain. The, the kinds of people who specialize in this area um, are called neuro-ophthalmologists. Um, and this also involves the second cranial nerve, which isn't shown, but that's the nerve that connects the brain directly to the vision of the eye itself, which comes in the back hair of the eye. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of different things that can affect the eye in this area. For example, if you see this big red uh, vessel in the back that says ICA, that stands for internal carotid artery. So that's one of the blood vessels that comes up off the heart, goes up the neck and travels kind of through the skull and ultimately perfuses the eye. But you see how the ICA is right next to cranial nerve three. And so this is an example of where if there's a problem with its blood vessel, for example, if there's an aneurysm, one of the blood vessels coming off of it, that can compress the third nerve. And then you'll get a specific pattern of eye muscle abnormality. So the eye won't move in a certain way. Um, and based on just looking at the eye and how the eye moves, you might be able to figure out that it is specifically localized to this area. And so again, there are a lot of diseases that can affect um, the eye, eye muscles and eye nerves as they travel along in the back of the eye in the orbit and in the skull. Um, you can have tumors, you can have 
you know, malignant cancers, metastasis, you can have vascular malformations, you can have infections, you can have um, a lot of common neurologic diseases like multiple sclerosis or strokes can, can affect these nerves as well. And the kinds of people who specialize in that are neurophthalmologists. Um, so moving on to looking at the eye sort of uh, straight on. So this is what the eye, what the skull would look like without the eye. Um, so this is what's commonly called the eye socket. We call it the orbit. Um, and so you can think of it kind of like if you have a, a video game and you're putting it into like a desk, all the cables come out the back. And so you have to have little openings in the back for them to get to the brain. Um, the point of the orbit and kind of like the skull is it's a very hard structure that helps protect the eye. The eye is a very delicate organ. Um, so you, you know, you need to be able to protect it, but the orbit also needs to be able to let all the important structures come in the back and also needs to be able to let the eye move around. Cause as we were saying, your eye needs to be able to move to function properly. Uh, so some of these openings in the back, like the one at the top, it says optic canal and the one below that is a superorbital fissure or where the optic nerve goes into the optic canal and superorbital fissures where a lot of the important nerves and veins and arteries go, um, that connect the eye to the brain and the rest of the circulation. There are a number of other important landmarks in this area. Um, but the other thing I want to point out is on the bottom here, how all the different bones kind of come together to form the orbit. And it's a little misleading because I, I think the two pictures are flipped. One's the right eye, one's the left eye. But this one on the bottom is the left eye. Or I'm sorry, this is the right eye. So the on the on the side where it says B, which is the left side of the screen, if you're looking at it, um, this yellow bone is the zygomatic bone, which forms the cheekbone. Um, and so that kind of gives you a sense of which eye it is. And you can see that the orbit is made up of seven different bones here, and they're color-coded kind of for ease. Um, and just as a side note, these pictures, I know someone had asked last year, these come from the BCSC. It's a kind of a textbook series that the ophthalmologists, that the American Academy of Ophthalmology makes and sends out um, for, you know, when you're studying ophthalmology, it's a very, it's a very good reference and it helps a very good way to learn all this stuff. So I, I you know, um, credit those books for providing these images. Um, the right side, as I was saying, as the, so the, left, the left side of the image, the right face, the yellow part is the zygomatic bone forms the cheek and most of the like bottom right part of the orbit, the lateral part of the orbit. Um, then at the bottom, you have the maxillary bone. So the maxillary bone forms most of the floor of the orbit. Um, the maxilla, you know, is a, is a bone in the face and the bottom of the maxilla, just for, for reference, um, is what forms the sort of roof of the mouth. Um, or I should say, like where the where the where your upper teeth come out. That's part of the that's the bottom part of the maxilla as well. And the top the screen bone is your frontal bone, which forms most of your forehead and forms most of the top of the orbit as well. And then you can see there are a number of other bones as well. Uh, following along the inside of the nose, you have the lacrimal bone, then you have the ethmoid bone, and then you have part of what's called the sphenoid bone. Um, the sphenoid bone is a very complicated shape, which we won't get into, um, but that is involved. It forms what's called the skull base, kind of like the center. Um, between the eyes and the orbit and the brain. Um, and then there's another bone called the palatine bone that forms part of the bottom as well. So why does this, you know, you learn all these things and you, you kind of wonder why it matters. Well, you know, learning about the anatomy of the bones and where they're located is really important because you can break any one of them and they kind of has different issues. Um, most often you break the medial or the inferior orbits um, because those are the most thin. So if someone has a kind of a minor, even a minor trauma, like they fall, or they, you know, they're assaulted and they hit their eye on something. Um, even a relatively minor trauma can cause a fracture of these two inferior medial, <clears throat> excuse me, inferior medial orbits. These the lateral wall and the superior wall, the sort of the, the outside and the top are much thicker. You can kind of see it here on this picture. And, you know, we do see them if someone has a, a severe trauma, like a, a high-speed motor vehicle collision or uh, a gunshot wound. We definitely see a lot of these traumas. Um, but they're less common. And but if you if you have an isolated orbital fracture, it's more often these smaller ones. And what can happen if you get that? Well, if the eye socket is not keeping the eye in the right place, then it's gonna be hard to keep the eyes, eyes lined up because if they're kind of in two different directions, then you're getting two different images, and that's gonna cause double vision, which is you know bad for patients' vision and you know uncomfortable and of course um, can negatively affect their ability to function. The other thing in particular about eye fractures is the eye muscles, um, which I showed on the previous picture, um, kind of track along the orbit here. So if one of the bone fragments 
uh, is open and the eye muscle gets stuck in one of the fractures. That's a specific diagnosis of something called entrapment. So the eye muscle gets trapped in the fracture. Um, and that is particularly problematic because, uh, again, it causes double vision. It can be very uncomfortable for patients, but the eye muscle, if it's squeezed like that, will lose its blood supply and can die. Um, and that's, again, very bad. So that is something that needs to be surgically fixed within you know, 24 hours or, or in that range. Um, the kind of doctors who specialize in this kind of diseases are called oculoplastic surgeons. Um, and that's a two-year fellowship outside of ophthalmology. Um, it, there's some overlap between that and neuro-ophthalmology in terms of diagnosis, but for most of the surgical procedures, um, those go to oculoplastic doctors. Now, uh, moving on a little bit, I know I mentioned the eye muscles. So this is the eyeball and the eye muscles shown within the orbit. So you kind of get a sense of, you know, how the eye sits within the eye socket. You can be looking at it from the side here and from the front at the bottom. And you can see there's six eye muscles. Um, there's sort of one in each main quadrant. So there's one at the top, one at the bottom, one on the left, one on the right. So we call that superior, inferior, lateral, and medial rectus muscles. And then there's two that kind of insert obliquely, meaning not at a 90 degree angle. And so those are called the oblique, superior oblique, and inferior oblique. You can see there's one at the top and there's one at the bottom. And with those six eye muscles, you get precise control of the eye movement, you know, up, down, left, and right, but also the eye can rotate in and rotate out. And, you know, you might be kind of confused about why the eye needs to do that. One reason is because if you tilt your head to the right, your eyes actually rotate a little bit to compensate and to stay lined up with each other. Um, but the other reason is that uh, the eye, eye movements themselves, if you only had four, you wouldn't necessarily be able to keep your eyes aligned in every single direction as you looked around because the eye has very tiny little movements that rotate left and right in addition to having to move up, down, and you know side to side. Um, the eye muscles attach close to the front of the eye and they kind of come all the way back and they don't go through those, those holes in the back of the skull as I was showing you, but they kind of attach right in front of them. Um, and I wanna point out the optic nerve here in the middle. Now, we talked a little bit about double vision and eye muscle issues, but you can have eye alignment issues that aren't related to neuro issues or plastic issues. You, might, you don't have a fracture, you don't have a stroke, but still the eye muscles may not be lined properly. And oftentimes that's a congenital thing. You may have seen uh, kids walking around who their eyes are crossed in a little bit or crossed out. Um, and, you know, of course they can be because of other issues. You could have a mass, you could have a stroke, uh, but they, they may not be as necessarily associated with those things. Um, and the reason why I bring that up is because this is a different area of ophthalmology called strabismus, which deals with eye alignment specifically. And it's very much uh, because a lot of kids tend to have these kinds of issues. Uh, pediatric ophthalmologists are often the strabismus experts uh, as well. They do adult strabismus and they do pediatric ophthalmology. Um, that's a different fellowship. You know, you get experience in all these different areas when you're doing general ophthalmology, but I, I do like to mention the fellowships just because, again, it kind of helps me remember to show you all, all the different areas of ophthalmology. Because, again, there's, there's a lot more than you'd expect. You know, I haven't really gotten to the eye itself yet, necessarily, but yet there's already talked about multiple different areas of, you know, types of diseases and types of treatments. Now, eye muscles themselves, when they don't line up, one of the, the main surgeries that strabismus doctors do is they will cut and reinsert the eye muscles. So you see how it's kind of attached at a specific point in the eye. <clears throat> what you can do is find that attachment, um, pass some sutures around it, cut it off, and then reattach it at a different area, either further back to make it a little weaker or shorten the muscle to make it a little bit stronger, or sometimes even move it up or down to kind of give you more of a complex realignment. Um, and so that's uh, another type of surgery that's often known called strabismus surgery. Um, so now we're getting to some of the, the structures of the eye itself. Um, and so this is a cross section going through the middle of the eye. So of course the eyeball is here on the right. And I have another picture um, talking about some of the details of the intraocular structures as well. So we're not gonna talk too much about that. Um, but you can see sort of all the different layers. You can see the skin, the, the orbicularis muscle, which helps you close the eye. Then you can see the levator muscle, which helps you open the eye. And these are all in the eyelids. And then you see some of the oil glands and some of the tear glands uh, located in the eyelids as well. And you see your eyelashes. And those are the main structures of the eyelids. And again, that, that um, I know we talked about oculoplastics doctors dealing with uh, bony structures of the orbit. You know, we can get infections or bleeding or bony fractures in the orbit. Um, but they also are the main ones who deal with eyelid abnormalities. So common eyelid abnormalities includes things called ptosis or ectropion or 
<clears throat> essentially if the eyelid is too high or too low, you know what I mean? You try to open your eyes, but your eyelid just won't open. Or you try to close your eyes and your eyelids won't close. Those can both be very problematic. Or if your eyelid, um, for whatever reason, maybe you have a scar or maybe you have a mess it's pulling the eyelid down and, you know, won't close properly. It's eyelids rotated out of position. Those are things that need to be fixed often with surgery. Excuse me. And oculoplastic doctors are, uh, you know, a type of ophthalmologist to, to do that kind of surgery. Um, they can reattach the eyelid. They can remove some of the muscles and remove some of the ligaments and rearrange things to help, you know, the eyelids function better. Um, the other thing I want to point out here is that it shows kind of a better, in a better example, how the eye muscles attach to the eye. So if you look at the top, you see this thing called the superior rectus and the bottom called the inferior rectus. And you see how they kind of curve along the orbit and they attach close to the front part of the eye. And you can imagine if the eye is a ball and the eye, I guess it's like this, or in this picture, like that. And the eye muscle attaches here, then if the eye muscle pulls, helps the eye look down. And so you have the eye muscles kind of all around the eye to help the eye look around in the different directions. Um, the other thing I want to point out here is, is something called the conjunctiva, which isn't shown as well in the next picture. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of something called conjunctivitis or commonly called pink eye, which is a viral conjunctivitis. Um, where someone wakes up and their eyes are really red and irritated, and you're like, what's going on? Um, another common cause is allergic conjunctivitis. So if people have allergies, you know, during the spring, they may notice their eye becomes red and watery and irritated. It's because there's this lining of conjunctiva, which we often call kind of the skin of the eye. Um, and it attaches at the inside of the eyelid, goes up into this little corner, not very far back, um, and then attaches again, sort of the end of the cornea, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but I bring it up because, you know, for example, if someone has contacts and people say the contact goes to the back of the eye, it doesn't, you can't go back all the way to the back of the eye. But what can happen is it gets kind of stuck in this corner. So now we're getting to the intraocular structures. Um, most general ophthalmologists, you know, end up, you have to be able to, you have to understand all the anatomy that we talked about for sure. Um, but sort of the more common diseases that ophthalmologists treat, general ophthalmologists and some of the other specialists deal with intraocular structures. So this is, again, your eye in cross-section. The front is at the top and the, uh, the back is at the bottom here. So going from the front to the back, you know, light comes in, goes through the cornea, which is the clear part, the very front of the eye. It goes through the pupil, um, which is this opening in the iris. So the iris is the colored part of the eye, and obviously there's that pupil in the center because the iris is open. Um, it goes through the lens, which helps focus light. Most of the focal power of the light uh, actually comes from the cornea. About two thirds of it comes from the cornea, but the lens does the rest, and uh, the lens is also variable. So the lens is responsible for when you're young, you're able to look at things that are far away and up close with the same pair of glasses or with no glasses. Uh, whereas you may have noticed that older people, you know, they need reading glasses because as you get older, your lens proteins don't function as well. And so the ability for your lens to change shape, to change the focal power, the refractive power of the eye decreases. And so that's why um, older people often need reading glasses. So then light has a kind of travels with this empty cavity called the vitreous. It's not empty, it's optically empty, but it's uh, filled with a, a collagen based, mostly collagen based substance that's a kind of a jelly. And then the light is caught at the back of the eye by the retina, which is a thin film that cover, covers the entire back surface of the eye. <clears throat> the retina is a neurosensory surface. So it's made of nerves and photoreceptors that, you know, chemically change the eye, ch uh, change light signals from photons to electrical signals. And those electrical signals are carried by the retina to this area called the optic nerve, which is where all the nerves of the retina come together and then they, that signal gets transmitted to the brain. And I, again, I showed the optic nerve on a couple of the earlier slides um, because you know uh, the optic nerve travels quite a ways to, to get to the brain. And then there's a lot of visual processing that goes on. Visual processing starts actually in the retina. Um, the retina has multiple layers and some of them are involved with you know, early visual processing, but then the actual you know, creation of or recognition of faces and you know what things are and where things are and how things are moving that happens in the brain in the back of the brain in the occipital lobe which I'm not really going to show here um so I want to show a couple other structures here in the eye um oh sorry one so and I'm going to mention the different areas of ophthalmology to deal with it so the cornea is a clear structure um and it needs to be clear to function properly so you can get two issues one if the, you can get many issues. You can get cloudiness at any area. So oftentimes the front of the eye, if you have a lot of dryness, 
for example, or if you get a scratch on the eye, that can affect the surface of the cornea. Those, those are often very sensitive and can be very painful. Um, but if they affect the, the, the clarity of the eye, then they also cause a decrease in vision. Um, then you can get scars and other issues or infections um, that affect the body of the cornea. And then on the inside of the cornea are particular cells that help maintain the clarity and the thinness of the cornea. The cornea has to be very thin um, and water has to be constantly pumped out to maintain its structural integrity. And that, that the cells responsible for that are on the inside called endothelial cells. There's epithelial cells on the outside, endothelial cells on the inside, and then stromal, the stroma in the middle. That's a kind of a general statement that's true for, you know, blood vessels and all kinds of things. But in, in the cornea, the endothelial cells are responsible for maintaining the clarity. Uh, and if you have issues with that, which is actually a relatively common thing, the cornea will swell up and become platy. And uh, those endothelial cells can be transplanted from, from a donor tissue for someone, uh, you know, for someone who's recently passed away. The earliest corneal transplants actually involve replacing the entire cornea. So you basically just cut around the cornea, remove someone's whole cornea, and suture in a donor cornea. And remarkably, that works. And it, it works pretty well. You know, it's obviously a relatively big surgery, and you have to be on immunosuppression long-term, local immunosuppression, eye drops. Um, but as people have gotten more advanced, then nowadays you can actually replace just the endothelial cells, which is a very thin sheet of tissues. Um, you remove the damaged endothelial cells in a patient and you get a donor tissue, remove the endothelial cell functioning <clears throat> from the donor graft and insert just that thin film that works remarkably well. So the kinds of people who do that are called corneal specialists. And that's, an, again, an additional year of, of, of fellowship if you wanted to. There's a uh, kind of an empty, a little bit of empty cavity filled with aqueous kind of water um, with salt, basically. Um, and the, the aqueous production is really important because that helps uh, maintain an eye pressure. Your eye pressure is different than blood pressure, but it's a similar concept, um, meaning that it's pressure because it's fluid and it contains space. And the aqueous fluid is produced by these, these uh, something called the ciliary body, which is right behind the iris, and it drains right in front of the iris. And so it follows this little path to production to drainage. And if the eye pressure is too high, you can get damage to the optic nerve. Um, and you can get damage to the optic nerve for many, many, many reasons, um, like some of the neuroophthalmic conditions you mentioned earlier. Um, but when it's, if you, there's a particular type of, of optic nerve damage called glaucoma, and that's associated with high eye pressure. And so that's a different subspecialty or a different area of ophthalmology that we often treat. Um, and we can treat glaucoma medically, you know, the medications that eye drops that can lower eye pressure and pills that can lower eye pressure as well. Um, but there's also many types of glaucoma surgeries. <clears throat> Either you can make, you know, put a, a tube or some sort of drainage pathway, external drainage pathway for the eye pressure to be relieved. Um, or you can do procedures to help decrease the production of eye fluid. Um, the next structure I want to talk about is the lens. And so, as I mentioned, the lens uh, helps focus light. And as you get older, it, it loses that ability to help focus. But the other thing that happens is it gets cloudier and cloudier. And that cloudiness of the lens is called a cataract. So you may have heard, you know, the most common surgery done in the world, the most common surgery done by ophthalmologists in the U.S., you know, it's, it's uh, everyone gets a cataract. And a lot of people have to have cataract surgery. It's when the lens gets cloudy and needs to be removed. And so I am going to show a cataract surgery at the end of this. As a general ophthalmologist, you know, that's one of the most common things we do. And in training, that's Kind of the main thing you're trained to do surgically you know you're trained to recognize and treat many other conditions but surgically speaking you do some strabismus surgery you do some oculoplastic surgery um you do maybe a little bit of retinal surgery um but by and large your, your focus of your training uh, is, is to learn how to do cataract surgery because most general ophthalmologists if you're going into practice that's going to be the main surgery you're going to be doing so i'll get back to some of the details but only the two things i want to point out here on this lens picture um, one, the lens basement membrane kind of forms a capsule around it, and then the, the lens itself is inside. So to do the surgery, you have to open that capsule, remove the lens, and we, we put the lens, the new lens, which is much smaller, inside the same capsule. Um, the capsule and the lens complex is supported by these fibers, which is just behind the iris, uh, and it's important not to damage those or the other parts of the capsule when you're doing the surgery. So moving back a little bit, I know I talked about the retina. Um, the retina is a very, like I said, it's a neural tissue, but has a lot of important vasculature. Common diseases that affect the retina are macular degeneration and diabetic retinopathy. Those are the two, probably the two most common diseases. <laughs> Those can cause bleeding or swelling in the retina. And so if it's not sensing light properly, that's going to decrease your vision. 
Um, and so those are often treated with injections or lasers, which can be done in clinic. Um, you can also get something called retinal detachment. So if you get a small tear or hole in any area of the retina, um, the mechanism that keeps the retina attached to it won't function properly. And so the retina will become detached and that is treated with surgery. Um, so the kinds of doctors who do those kinds of surgeries, retinal detachment surgery, and most of the treatment of diabetes and macular degeneration are retina specialists, um, which is what I'm starting to do now. The other thing I wanted to mention um, is there's a lining here, which is a little bit hard to see, but you can get inflammation along any of the tracks of the eye, in the front of the eye, in the back of the eye. And we call that uveitis because the uvea is the name for this middle layer of tissue. So you see the outer layers is comprised of the cornea in the front and the sclera, which forms the eye wall in the back. That's the white part of the eye, the cornea is clear. Then inside of that, you have the uvea, which forms the iris in the front. So your body, which I talked about, causes um, helps create the eye, eye pressure and also helps hold the lens. And then the chorite, which is the layer of uvea in the back, which is, helps supply blood to the retina. Um, and then the innermost layer is the retina, which, which I mentioned as well. So uveitis uh, is, a, is a disease that can affect many parts of the eye. And there is a subspecialty in uveitis, although many, many types of ophthalmologists often treat it. Um, but that's a different one to your fellowship you could do. So that is most of the uh, teaching in terms of what the eye is and what the areas around the eye and sort of the different areas of ophthalmology. And I tried to talk about some of the different types of surgery as well. So um, let me see here. I see a question if the fluid is dried out. So that's a, that's a really good question. So diet can play a role in the um, composition. So the question was, if the fluid is dried out as a side effect of certain medications, are there eye drops that can help or does drinking water uh, help enough? So in there's two answers to that, or I guess there's two questions. Eye drops definitely can help. So there are medications like that affect tear, tear production. Tear production is mediated through the parasympathetic system, which is a, a signaling a signaling system throughout the body. And a lot of medications have anti-parasympathetic effects. So for example, things like, like Benadryl have a little bit of that as well. And there's a lot of medications that kind of fit that category. So definitely certain medications can cause dryness. Um, and it, it, the question that specifies is the fluid. I'm, that's that's, tear, that's the tear film fluid, which again, is a different fluid from the fluid that's inside the eye. Um, but if the tear film is dry, that's what causes dry, dry eye disease. The tear film in the eye is made of more than just of liquid tears, but there's also a, a mucus component made by certain cells in the conjunctiva. And there's also a fatty lipid component made by certain cells in the eyelid. And so it's those combinations of things. And you can have deficiencies in certain areas that cause dryness. Um, drinking water is, not, is definitely a good thing, but it's not enough um, to increase the tear production because drinking water is not going to cause your lacrimal gland to secrete more tears. Um, unless you're super dehydrated, that's most likely not the reason why you're you know, eyes not producing enough tears. There are artificial tears, which are a very common eye drop that you get over the counter that do help with dry eye medication. And then dry eye often has a very inflammatory component to it, meaning um, if you measure the tears of someone who has dry eye disease, you know, it's kind of misleading. Dry eye is a little bit of a misnomer. It may not mean that there's no tears. It, just may, it may mean that the tears are poor quality and are very inflammatory. So it may be hurting the eye, even though there are tears. And so there are certain anti-inflammatory drops, like you can give steroids, topical steroids to help with that, or some more sort of newer, more targeted medications to help. Um, so that answers the question. So I wanted to get to sort of the weekly schedule of ophthalmologists, and this is particularly for residency, um, but it's it's similar, I think, for attendings. Uh, attending after you finish residency when you're kind of fully trained ophthalmologist in your practice. Uh, so ophthalmology, one of the nice things is there's no, you know, it's clinic-based, outpatient-based. So you're in clinic hours, you know, you don't have to do routine night shifts, um, especially after you finish your training. You don't have to work most weekends, um, again, after you finish your training. But you are still relatively busy. I would say on average 50, 60 hours, sometimes as high as 80, rarely do you cross that. You know, legally now you're not allowed to cross 80. They've kind of put some restrictions on how much you're allowed to work uh, per week. And most programs are pretty good about following that. Uh, so we generally get it around seven, finish around six. <clears throat> you see patients and that's majority of your schedule. You see patients and you do surgery. Those are the two things you do. Um, so, you know, when you see a patient, it's kind of similar to what I think you would imagine seeing a, a doctor is like, you know, you walk in, you talk to the patient, you say, you know, how are you feeling? What's, you know, what's, what's bothering you? What brings you in? 
sometimes you know uh oh right here sometimes you, you know what why they're coming in because it's a return visit um but other times they're a new patient you have to figure out they might say oh my eye hurts or i don't see as well as i used to or they have other issues and then after you talk with them you see what's bothering them <clears throat> Then you take a look at the eye and we talked about all the different parts of the eye. So you want to examine each part of the eye, you know, through testing its function, but also by looking at it and seeing, you know, what it really looks like. And, and a lot of things in ophthalmology, uh, one of the nice things about it is you can, you can often identify the problem on your exam. So someone says you can't see well and you look in and they have this very cloudy lens inside their eye. It's, it's, uh, it's satisfying to say, oh, well, okay, this is what's causing the problem. And then you can kind of move along to the different treatments. Um, in clinic, also you do some procedures like injections. Uh, you can do injections in the eyelids and in the eye and lasers. Um, but then the other thing we often do is surgery. I wanna go back to this previous slide for one second because I didn't talk so much about call responsibilities. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, you know, if someone comes to the emergency room with an eye issue, you know, the emergency doctors are will be good at triaging it and saying, you know, how serious is this? Is this something that if it's a common disease, they may feel more comfortable treating it, but oftentimes they might not be as familiar with the specifics of eye issues. And so they'll call you and they'll say, hey, we have this patient in the emergency room that needs to see an ophthalmologist, what should we do? And so that responsibility of who's on call um, kind of floats around from resident to resident and varies from program to program. But in general, you're on call once a week, you know, one night. So you'll work that day from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Then you'll get, you'll, you know, get calls that night from the emergency room or from the inpatient units or from the trauma units saying, hey, if you have this person has eye issue, can you come see them? Uh, and you do that about one weekend a month too. So from in my previous program, uh, we had eight residents taking calls. So it, it was a little less than once a week um, and then one weekend a month. So, you know, from Friday to Saturday, you may have to go in over the weekend. But for me, you know, you may be seeing as many as 10 patients in a night, maybe more, oftentimes less. Um, in a weekend, you might see 20 or 30, which is pretty busy. Um, and, you know, when you're training, that's your responsibility. The junior residents often are the ones responsible for seeing that. And then as you get further along in your training, like my last year, I wasn't necessarily going in to see the patients as much as the, the junior resident, you know, the first or second year trainee would see the patient, examine them, make their assessment of what they thought was going on. And then they would call the senior resident and say, you know, this is what I think is going on. What do you think? Are there other things I should ask? Are there things I should look for? Um, and then the other train, the other change that happens as you become more of a senior resident is you start to do more and more surgeries. So again, this varies from program to program, but when you're starting off, you are doing more extraocular surgery, which is like the eye muscle surgery we talked about, or the eyelid surgeries that we talked about. Um, and you may be doing that once a week um, on average. Um, but then as you become a senior, you spend more and more time doing intraocular surgery. And the majority of that is cataract surgery. So as a senior resident, you're probably operating closer to two times a week. And you're doing maybe five cases a day, five to 10 cases a week, um, five to 10 different surgeries. And uh, that's the other change that happens as you get further along in your training. Then after you're finished training, you know, as attending ophthalmologists, attendings rarely take primary call, meaning they're not going to ED, but they may still be taking calls from the emergency room. <clears throat> and they also are taking calls from their own patients. So for example, if you do surgery on someone and they call that night saying, "Yo, my eye is hurting a lot, you know, what can I do? What should I, what should I come in? Um, that's something you want to know as a surgeon. That's something that even as you're attending ophthalmology, you still are responsible for your patients after hours, um, even if you're not necessarily as busy going into covering a specific emergency room or something. Um, so uh, we talked about this on the right here of this image is something called the slit lamp, which many of you I'm sure have seen. It's basically a microscope, a binocular microscope on, tri on, on, uh, on a rack, on rails, um, and it has this light source that you can form into a narrow slit and shine at different angles. And because the eye is a clear structure um, and comprised of many different layers, being able to use a narrow beam at different angles really helps you zone in on specific areas. Like for example, I was saying that the inner layer of the cornea, the endothelium may make it damaged in certain diseases. Um, you wouldn't really be able to see that if you were just looking at the eye directly or even just looking with like a, a regular microscope or like a magnifying glass or something like that. But if you have the specific light source and this binocular view, you can you can get a great view of, of things you would not otherwise be able to see. Um, there are a lot of cameras that we use, which I'm not going to get into. Um, one of my particular interests is in imaging, and that's one of the things I like about ophthalmology. There's a lot of really cool images and imaging modalities that we use um, to help take care of patients in clinic. So 
I did try to cover this as we were going through the different types of anatomy. Um, you can operate on the eyelids, orbit, eye muscles, front of the eye, the cornea, the cataracts, and for different glaucoma procedures, and then operate the back of the eye as well, retina, vitreous. Um, the optic nerve, you know, there's not too much surgically that we do from an intraocular approach. Rarely you can do uh, optic, excuse me, optic nerve sheath penetrations, removing nerve, like uh, masses around the nerve, but that's not really on here so much. Um, yeah, so at this point, we can go on to uh, looking at the surgical video. And so I'm going to show one video of a relatively straightforward cataract surgery, which again, is the most common surgery you'll see. And I think if you were going to shadow an ophthalmologist, I'm, I'm certain you would see that. Uh, and then I have two sort of more complex surgeries. One is a uh, after a complicated cataract surgery, and one is after an eye trauma, um, repairing the eye, iris, and then repairing also, or putting in what's called a secondary eye wall. So let me exit out of this. Okay, and I am hopefully sharing the video. Can uh, anyone confirm they see see my screen here, see the picture of the eye? Yes, we do. Okay, perfect. So this patient is uh, getting set up for cataract surgery. So um, we're looking at the eye through the microscope view. And one thing that's really nice about seeing an ophthalmologist when they're doing surgery is, you know, when you're seeing someone in clinic, it, it actually, it, it takes some time to be able to examine patients and see the things that you need to see. Whereas this view is specific, is recorded off the microscope that the surgeon is using to keep things in view. So you're seeing exactly what the surgeon is seeing. They have a binocular view. Um, so they do get more depth perception and the view is, is a little better in person. Um, so the basic steps here, what we'll do, the patient has been dilated. So this is, you know, you can see the white part of the eye. You can see the conjunctiva overlying it. You can see the iris where the pupil is very big. And we need the pupil to be big to be able to access the lens, which is behind the iris. Um, you can see, uh, again, hopefully you can see my mouse. Um, there's kind of these metal bars on the, the left and right of the screen. And those that's an eyelid speculum, which is essentially an eyelid holder that helps open the eye. Because, you know, you don't want the patient to be blinking or anything. Um, the eye is numb. We use topical lidocaine basically to uh to numb the eye and for this kind of surgery that's actually all, all you need you know you don't need to do anything more um patients are awake they can hear you talking um some patients don't need anything more than literally just a drop of numbing medicine to do the surgery but we often give them more than that to make sure that they're comfortable so again the approach to the surgery is we're going to make two small incisions at the corner of the cornea at the edge of the cornea then we're going to make an opening in the capsule the front of the eye um, in the front of the lens, sorry. Then we're going to use an ultrasound machine to break up the lens and remove it from the eye. And then you'll see also in my left hand, I'll have a metal instrument that's going to help me maneuver the lens around and break it up as I'm removing it. And then after we remove the lens, and we're going to put in a new lens that's made of plastic. Um, so again, I'll, I'll kind of narrate in real time here as we're doing. So this is a, a blade that I'm holding, and we're making a small opening in the side. And this is about a millimeter just to give you a sense, the cornea is about 10 millimeters across. And so this is obviously a magnified view. That's just some fluid to keep the front of the eye from drying out. Now we're injecting, this is a small cannula with a little bit of numbing medicine. So I said often that, um, you know, topical medicine is enough and it, and it often is, but this medication also has a, uh, is two medicines. One is a numbing medicine and also has epinephrine, which helps dilate and stabilize the iris tissue. There are certain medications that can cause the iris to be very mobile during surgery which can be problematic if we want to keep it out of the way. Now what I'm injecting is a uh, gel that helps maintain space in the eye. And, you know, you can do the surgery. They used to do the surgery with just aqueous, just basically fluid inside the eye, but the gel helps keep, keep things stable. Um, now this is our main incision, which is a 2.2 millimeter wide blade. And uh, this is where we're doing most of our, most of our work through that main incision. Now, this is a small forceps, and you'll see here that the capsule, a lot of what you're seeing, so I paused it here, you can see these wrinkles. Um, that is the anterior capsule. So uh, a lot of what we're seeing is based on the, the reflex. So the lens itself is not red, um, but because we're shining light in the eye, the eye is bouncing off the retina and the, the back of the eye, which it has full blood vessels, so it does give the eye a red appearance. That's a red reflection, but we're basically looking through a clear, not clear, but cloudy, but translucent lens. 
um, and these kind of uh, this reflections, these reflections off the surfaces of the eye can tell you what's going on. So you look at these wrinkles, that's the anterior capsule. So we're going to create an opening in it. And once I, once I create the opening, you'll see. So I'm grabbing it and you see there's a very thin, I hopefully it's transmitting well, but you can see this very thin membrane. And that's the anterior capsule. We're creating a nice round opening in the front of it. Um, and this round opening is the area where we'll have access to the lens. So this capsule is made up of the basement membrane of the lens. And again, the basement membrane surrounds the lens and is attached to the zonules, which helps hold up the lens. Um, but by you know creating a small and controlled opening in the front of it, that lets us remove the lens, uh, but also lets us put the new lens we're putting inside of that opening, um, which is a very stable place for the lens to be. So now what I'm doing is I'm injecting a little bit of water, a little bit of saline uh, around the lens under that opening in the capsule that I made. Um, and what this does is it helps separate the lens from the capsule and allows us to remove it a little bit easier. So this, this is a, a cannula that's attached to, to a syringe with some water in it, or saline, I should say. And this is the main instrument we'll be using. This is the FACO emulsification probe. Um, and as I was saying, it uses a uh, high frequency ultrasound energy to break up the lens. Um, but it has three parts to it. You know, part of it, this is the patient moving a little bit. I think he had to cough or something. <clears throat> um, part of it flows, allows fluid to flow into the eye to maintain the space. Um, part of it is an aspiration that sucks material out of the eye. So when you break up the lens, you can suck it out. And then part of it is the FACO emulsification, which actually applies energy to the lens to break it up. Um, and you can see that I'm applying energy in the sort of groove. And now you, it should be a little easier to kind of visualize the cataract um, because you can see it kind of being sculpted out to the middle. And so there are many sort of techniques to, to how to approach a cataract removal, but oftentimes because we want to make that small opening, the lens is bigger than that, we can't just remove the cataract in one piece. We have to break it up into little pieces. So I'm going to break it into a half. That's the second instrument I was saying. And it should be a little bit clearer how the lens is structured once you see it broken into half and you see it broken into quarters. So I'm applying just a little bit of pressure to help break the lens into two big chunks, um, which I'll then break into quadrants. Uh, and then once, and then that those quadrants are small enough to remove the little opening. So you can see, I'll pull it open here. You see in the top right, um, it's a little hard to see now. You see how there's a difference in the red reflex. You see how it's kind of clear on the outside. It's cloudy in this area that we're working on. And then in the very middle, you see a very, very clear reflex. And that's because we're seeing through the cataract all the way to the back of the eye. Um, so now what I'm doing is now I'm taking those two little halves and breaking them into quarters. And the way I'm doing this is, is using that second instrument to literally kind of pincer between the, the fake emulsification probe and that second instrument. And then now this little quadrant, you'll see I'm gonna aspirate, I'm gonna use the vacuum to pull it into my probe and pull it to the center of the eye where I can use the ultrasound energy to safely remove the rest of it. Um, and you, you know, the, the fake emulsification is a lot of power and you have to be careful that the lens capsule, we make a small opening in the front. We don't want to damage it anywhere else. We don't want to damage it, especially in the back of the eye, because that's what's stopping the lens from falling all the way to the back of the eye. So now you can see here um, what I have, what's coming forward is a quadrant of lens coming to the nucleus, coming to the, the fake emulsification probe, where then I can apply the, the ultrasound energy, break up the lens and suck it out. And again, you want to be careful not to be doing this too far back to, to the back of the eye, because if the ultrasound energy goes to the back of the lens, it can break the capsule. If the ultrasound energy goes too close to the iris, it can <clears throat> damage the iris and cause bleeding and cause inflammation. If it goes too close to the cornea, it can cause some of those endothelial cells I was talking about. It can damage those and cause the cornea to become cloudy after. So again, I'm reaching with my second instrument going all the way around the lens. And then you'll see here that it's separated once I split it across. The first pass didn't quite work, but now that second lens is split. And now you can see some of those areas where the red reflex, you know, that red color that you're seeing is a lot clearer. And that's because there's no longer a cloudy cataract blocking your view. So you can imagine that's what the patient is seeing. The patient is looking through this, you know, walking around day to day. But once you do the cataract surgery, they're not looking through it anymore. And that's why they see better. So this is the last chunk. And again, you can really see the kind of lens shaped structure 
of the cataract um, as you're moving it. Um, the next thing what we'll do after we remove this is there's some residual cortical cataract. So the cataract itself is made of multiple layers. There's a certain nucleus, the center of the cataract, which or the center of the lens, I should say, which is um, made, you know, as when you're born, you have that. And then you have this cortex, which is being produced in kind of layers around it. So we remove the nucleus. That's the hardest part that requires the emulsification probe. Um, but then the sort of these residual kind of ragged edges that you see are some of the cortical fibers, which you can move with just aspiration. So, you know, just with a little bit of gentle vacuum, which is what I'm doing now. So kind of gently vacuuming, pulling it in, um, and removing some of those extra fibers. And so, and again, I want to point out how you can notice that the red reflex is really clearing up nicely. And that's because now there's less and less opacity in our view. So we're not, we're getting a very nice, you know, reflection of the back of the eye. And looking at this, you can see the sort of edge of the capsule rexus, the opening in the anterior capsule that I made. Um, it's a little bit off-centered. You know, you, you want it to be as centered as possible, but it, it's a little bit, you know, off to the right. Um, but you can see the edge of it. Okay, so now what we're doing, pretty much done. We're putting a little more of a, of a gel to open up the lens capsule so that when we put the lens in, uh, it, it has a nice place to go. The new lenses are made of acrylic, plastic, um, there are many different types of lenses, you know, we're not getting into kind of the details. Now there was some, I think there's a minute we're waiting for the lens to come. Here we go. So the lens is rolled up inside this little injector and you'll see as we inject it, it kind of unfolds. The lens has two little arms coming off of it that help stabilize it and hold it in the right place. And then the center of the lens looks kind of like what you'd expect. It's a little like discoid piece of plastic that helps focus light. So we're kind of putting in the right spot, letting those arms open up and they're they're pressing up against the rest of the capsule. And that's why the rest of the capsule needs to be intact for its kind of lens to go in. And uh, that's that's pretty much it. Um, we uh, then remove the rest of the gel, you know, the, the gel that we injected, we wanna remove that so that the eye is just filled with aqueous, you know, kind of this natural fluid. And then after we do that, Everything looks good. And that's it. We seal up the wounds. We don't need to put a suture in, but we do inject a little bit of water into the stroma of the cornea, into the body of the cornea that thickens it temporarily to help with wound closure. And then at the end of the case, we make sure everything looks good, make sure the lens looks like in the right place, make sure the eye pressure is at a reasonable level. And then we use this little sponge um, to make sure that the wounds aren't leaking, which would be an infection risk. Um, and, you know, would be bad for other reasons too, but that's one of the main reasons. And that's it. Typically after surgery like this, we see patients um, the day after, about a week after, about a month after, it takes about a month for it to heal up. Um, and then they're on eye drops for that time as well. So I know we're close to 10. Um, maybe I can show part of the other video just because I think it's interesting to see. Um, and then we can stop. And if we have if we have extra time, I can show the last video. So this is different type of surgery. This is doing what's called a vitrectomy, um, which is uh, when you remove the, the big space in the back of the eye called the vitreous, uh, it's filled with jelly and you have to remove that jelly if you want to access things in the back part of the eye. So in this situation, this patient actually had a, a cataract surgery that was very complicated. Um, and so as I was saying, you want to make sure that the back part of the capsule does not open up. Um, but sometimes if there's trauma or if there's other issues, um, Uh, it, can, it can open and some of the lens protagonists can be retained. And that's bad because, mainly because they cause a lot of inflammation inside the eye. Um, but in this situation, we weren't able to put a lens in in the initial surgery because there was no support for it. So in addition to doing a vitrectomy to remove the vitreous and remove some of the retained lens fragments, we also are going to be um, putting in a secondary lens. So suturing a lens directly to the eye. You know, when you can't put it in the natural bag, you have to kind of get creative about where you can put it. So the basics of doing a vitrectomy are, um, it's a little more setup. You have to put in a couple of these, what's called trocars. So they're essentially um, tiny little tubes that let you access the back of the eye through the white part of the eye. 
Um, and one of the tubes, this one, this first one we're putting in is an infusion, so it helps maintain eye pressure. In the previous surgery, the infusion was all new management that we're using. But in this situation, we're, we're separating it, so it's kind of providing constant infusion. Um, and then uh, we'll have two other uh, tubes or trogars at the top that we'll put our instruments in, excuse me, to do the majority of the surgery. And the other part of the surgery that we're doing is, uh, again, it's moving a little bit. Um, the other part of the surgery that we're doing is we're going to remove some of the, open up some of the conjunctiva, which you'll see as I'm, I'm doing now. Um, and this will give us access to a place where we can put the sutures in to hold the lens <clears throat> that we're going to implant in this, in this patient's eye. And I'll point out here, this kind of black uh, line that you see at the cornea um, radially is part of the, is a suture that we put in um, at the end of the previous surgery. So I said we oftentimes don't have to put in sutures, but in situations where someone's going to need another surgery, there's an issue with the wound, or, you know, if it just isn't closing the way you'd like, then you can put a suture in. So we didn't in the previous situation, in this patient's previous surgery. And so we're using uh, fine scissors to create a little bit of an opening in the conjunctiva. And again, I know we're running close, so I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. Oops. Uh, and then I'll just show you the opening on one side and I'll, I'll skip the other side. So using tiny forceps, you can see how we're creating a little bit of a plane under the conjunctiva to give us access to the sclera, which is the white part of the eye. So again, remember how I was saying that the conjunctiva comes from the inside of the eyelids and kind of asserts all the way up to the edge of the cornea. You can see that really well here because you're removing it now from the edge of the cornea side. <clears throat> and so we we do that. We put some markings in. Um, we put the markings. I'll skip forward. This is the, the green instrument we're using is some cautery to help control the blood vessels in the area that we're working on. So there's not too much bleeding. Um, and then we're going to make markings on where we're going to put the sutures for the lens. And then those are those areas that we're going to suture are also the areas we're going to do our vitrectomy for. We're going to put our ports in from that area. So we put the marks in. And these are little calipers marking exactly where we're going to make our further incisions. Surgery is all about you know planning and preparation. And so really, even at this point, we're still kind of setting up the, the main part of the surgery. But it's very, very important for any kind of surgery to have a, a good plan and to think about where you're going to do things and what your backup plan is and, and everything. So this is another trocar. There's a sharp point at the front, which is going to come out. Uh, and then when you take it out, that leaves a small cannula, you know, kind of a port, like a round little tube. So you see that sharp part came out and now there's just a little tube here that we can use. So again, I'll fast forward a little bit more towards the end of this. And so now what we're doing is uh, we've put some of the, we've put the uh, one more of these trocars in. And then we're putting special lenses in front of the microscope. So you can see here, I'll pause on the right side. I know it's, it's kind of blurry. On the right side, you see a little metal instrument and that's the vitrector mouth. So that's the instrument that's removing the vitreous. And the, on our left hand, we have a light, which is where the illumination is coming from. And then you can see this kind of reddish stuff at the bottom. That's a kind of a hazy view of the retina that we're seeing in the back of the eye. And this big white thing that we're seeing in the center, that's some of the retained nucleus, the retained lens that we're going to have to remove. So now we're just removing, and you can see that little bit of lens kind of floating around there. And we'll get to that. Um, but we're just removing all the vitreous. The vitreous can pull on the retina, so you can't just go in and grab this lens and pull it out. So then it'll pull on the retina and cause a retinal attachment. So you have to remove the vitreous kind of very methodically before you get to that point. Um, and so this is closer to the end where we've removed most of the vitreous, removed the lens, and now you can start to see some of the blood vessels and the, the normal retina at the back. What we're doing now is applying a little bit of laser. Um, the laser helps prevent against retinal attachments. And Again, I don't want to go too much past 10. But now what we're doing is we're getting this lens, this new lens ready. And we're passing sutures through the lens. This lens has little eyelets. So those haptics on the previous one were basically like arms, but these arms have little holes in them. And so we can use that by passing a suture through them. 
then what we're going to do is pass the suture through these holes in the lens, through the holes that we made in the sclera. And that's how this lens is going to be attached into in, in this person's eye. So that's one side. And then we'll do the other side. Sorry, I apologize, it's a little bit out of focus. And so now what we're doing is we're going through one of the prior openings we made, and this is a tiny pair of forceps. Um, and you can see it right behind the pupil. Once you get back into view, you can see that little tiny forcep right behind the pupil. Oops. You can see it well right here. And you'll see I'll, I'm holding that in my left hand. <clears throat> I'm holding the suture, which you pass the lens in my right hand, and we're passing it through the hole of the opening on the other side. And uh, it's what's challenging here is the wound that we made, you know, if you make a opening in it, all the fluid's going to want to empty out of that. So you can see the tendency for that. But then we go in, gently, quickly grab the other side, and we pull it through. So now we place one suture out of four. Um, and then if we fast forward a little bit, we do it again on the other side. Again, you can see the suture. In this situation, we're going through one of the ports we used. Uh, for the bottom one, we didn't use a port. We just kind of went straight through the, the sclera of the eye. And now we have half the lens fixated. So then if we go to the last part of this video, oh, sorry. and then we'll get ready to inject the lens. Okay, um, so we can stop there. I don't want to make sure I have time to answer questions. Uh, I do have one of the video, which I'll I'll save for later. Oh, okay, let's see. Is there any causal link between LASIK and mental health complications? That's an interesting question. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, causal meaning, like if someone has LASIK, does that cause mental health issues? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I would have to do some research to answer. I mean, certainly LASIK, uh, there have been reports. Um, the cornea is a very sensitive area, so doing any kind of character refractive procedure, which I didn't talk about, but that involves making a small opening in the very, very front part of the cornea, uh, reshaping the body of the cornea. And that helps with refractive error. Um, and it's generally very, you know, a, a generally a pretty successful surgery, but because you're going through the anterior part of the cornea, which has a lot of nerves, can be, can be painful. Um, so where's the question go? So the, the question is, is there any causal link between that and mental health complications? There have been some reports of chronic pain or like lots of pain, which can definitely you know, be very stressful for patients to 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 have to deal with after surgery. Um, but I again I don't know the answer to that question. Um, so can I repeat the name? So the first I wasn't sure when the question came in. The first surgery was just called cataract surgery. So it's cataract extraction, fake emulsification, and intraocular lens implantation. The second one um, was a pars plane of vitrectomy. So we're doing a vitrectomy, removing the vitreous through the pars plane, which is a certain part of the eye, um, with secondary or the scleral sutured eye wall. So we're suturing an eye uh, intraocular lens to the sclera of the eye. So that was the second surgery. Um, how many times do you have to do these procedures? So yeah, training to learn to do these procedures is definitely a very different skill. I mean, I think you're all gonna get very experienced, you know, how to study and how to take tests and how to learn the material from the book. Um, but being able to 
do surgery is, is a different skill. Um, in general, you know, what we do is we'll have instructional lessons and people will show us videos and talk us through the different steps of the surgery. And then we also have some wet labs. Um, so we'll have either pig eyes or cadaveric human eyes where we'll, you know, practice holding some of the instruments and moving, maneuvering inside the eye. Um, and then we also have a surgical simulator, which is a, basically a robot, a robot eye connected to a screen with like these special instruments that sense where you are and what you're doing. So you can kind of get, again, a, a hand on how to do the steps and everything. Um, but doing it for your first time in, a, in an actual patient is definitely a big step. Um, very can be very stressful. Um, we're very fortunate. I was very fortunate when we're training. There's two surgeons who were very experienced, very, very good surgeons and very, you know, kind of comforting presences in the operating room. So, you know, the first time you do it is always going to be the first time you do it. But um, you, you probably watch for about a year and then you do maybe five to 10 or 10 to 20 or so. You're very, very close to provision. You're under very close to provision the whole time. But I mean, like as you're learning and once you do the first five to 10, or I would say maybe about 10 or so, you are able to do all the steps and, you know, you're slow. And you definitely have a lot of room to grow. Um, but I did about 150 as a resident, which the average, I forget what the average is, but I think most people do at, at minimum, the government requires you to do 83 or so to, to be part of residency and to finish. Obviously, the more, the better. There are a few programs out there who do, you know, 300, 400. Um, I would say most people are in the like 100 or 200 range, which is enough that you deal with some of the common complications that you feel comfortable doing on your own. But of course, the more you do, the better you'll get. Hi, I'm Robin. Um, I work with Teleshadowing. I'll run the rest of the Q&A session. So I just want to thank you before I start for uh, taking your time to do this session with us today. Um, I think eye health is one of the things that we sort of just take for granted, like your eyes are there and they work and, until something goes wrong. Um, so what are some of the best practices you recommend for protecting our vision and eye health? Yeah, that's a great question. And thank you um, for asking. Uh, it, it's There's a couple of things. I think one of the, when you're when you're very young, um, there's been multiple studies that have shown that, uh, you know, outdoor time and spending time in natural light um, is good for the development of your eye. Um, and that decreases your need. You know, as you may or may not know, kind of the need for glasses has kind of increased very rapidly in the past recent, in the recent years. And not only is that, you know, people don't like wearing glasses, but also if your need for glasses is very thick, that means your eye is not developed properly. And that can cause some, some problems later on. So spending time outside when you're young, um, like elementary, middle school age is very helpful. And then when we're sort of closer to your age and you're, you know, on your computer a lot, studying a lot, doing a lot of those kinds of things, there hasn't been a lot of evidence that that is really bad for your eye health, which is kind of a good thing to know that it's not bad, but it also can be very straining for your eyes. It can be uncomfortable. Your eyes can get dry and irritated. So what we what we tell our patients um, is that when you have to be on your screen for a long time, it's good to take a break every 20 minutes. Um, and uh, actually Dr. Levin, uh, has, has shared this to me in 20, 20, 20 rules. So you, every 20 minutes, you take a 20 second break and look 20 feet away. So the idea is to give your eyes a break from, from once staring at things up close, a break from artificial light. And if you're close to a window or something, then you get a little break where you can look far away, relax your eyes, blink a couple of times. Um, if you find that your eyes are getting very irritated and dry when you're studying and, and reading and on a screen a lot, artificial tears are things that can help too. But again, if it's, if it's bothering you, it's definitely a good time to, to you know kind of get a checkup. And if you go get glasses or whatever, bring it up with your eye doctor and say, you know, this is something that's bothering me. What can I do? Um, I will also mention that blue light glasses are a thing that are commonly thought about now. There's no real evidence that it, it helps. Um, there's also no evidence that it hurts. So I went, you know, I don't, if patients ask me about it, I say, that's what I tell them. I, you know, I don't say you need to get them. If people are using them and they find that it helps, you know, of course, it's a good thing. It's not going to cause you harm, but that's, that's not really going to help you. As someone who has seen an ophthalmologist like six times in the last year for dry eye, definitely important to keep in mind. <laughs> yes. Um, so and another thing that's, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you're good. Go ahead. Oh, just one other thing. You know, in general, what's good for your general health is good for your eyes. So, you know, getting a balanced diet with lots of vegetables and, and those kinds of things are going to be good for your eyes um, because a lot of systemic diseases can affect your eye, but also, you know, eating omega threes and, and those kinds of things can help your chair foam and, uh, you want to be overall healthy in addition to keeping your eyes healthy. So you mentioned that you have a biomedical background. Do you ever find that that engineering training comes into play in your residency training or in medical school? Yeah, I, I found it very helpful. Um, some people, you know, it's definitely, I definitely met 
multiple other people who do engineering. Most people, I think, have a background in more science, like biology or bioscience, neuroscience, those kinds of things. Um, you know, in the day to day, I on I had people who studied writing or studied music and go into medicine. Like your your actual day to day, you can do with any kind of degree. You'll learn what you need to learn to practice medicine. But for me in particular, you know, if you have research interests, that's where your other background can really play a role. So people who have you know biology or you know cellular background may be more interested in doing lab work and and cell lines and those kinds of things. But for me, with an engineering background, I I have a lot of interest in imaging. And that's some of the things I learned as an undergrad, which I've been able to apply in ophthalmology. So I definitely do find it useful. Although I will say, you know, again, whatever you study, I think you'll be able to find a way to, to use it. So was it that interest in like imaging that drew you to ophthalmology and specifically like vitreo retinal surgery? That was definitely part of it. That was definitely a big part of it. Um, ophthalmology, you know, imaging is used in all medicine. Um, but one of the nice things about ophthalmology is that we kind of like our, our imaging is specific. Like most, most imaging for other specialties will go through radiologists. And so someone else will look at the image, someone else is trained to interpret it. And you of course can look at your specific part, but for ophthalmologists, you know, the imaging that we order is specifically for the eye. So we order it, we interpret it, we have to understand how it works. Um, and in recent years, imaging, there's been sort of a couple of new types of imaging that really taken off and uh, improved our understanding and treatment of a lot of diseases. So as some, and that, that's, particularly in retina, um, in others as well, like glaucoma. Um, so when I was thinking about where I would fit in and how I could use my skills most, that was part of what drew me towards ophthalmology and definitely retina. So as you finish up your training, what are your thoughts of what your future looks like? Do you want to open your own practice or join an existing? I think I would, I would like to start off by joining an academic practice. Um, you know, I, I still, I know I'm finishing my training, I guess it's interesting to think about it that way, but I still, you know, I still have time to, I, I still need to learn about exactly what kind of practice I want. Cause I think one of the things you realize is th those are definitely the kind of the big categories, like private, like join your own practice or create your own practice, join a private practice, join an academic group. But within those, there's still very, a lot of variables. Like there's, where do you want to practice? And even within the field of repair and surgery, it's like, well, what type of things do you want to specialize in? <clears throat> there are many different areas where you know, I could focus more on one thing, more one or a handful of type of diseases than others. Um, and then there's, you know, where you want to practice, like I was saying, like a rural setting or a city setting or, you know, what part of the country. Um, and then if you're joining a group or an academic group, a private or academic group, they're, they're very, you know, there's some private practice groups that are very academic oriented. There's some academic groups that are very small. There's some that are very big. There's some that do a lot of research. There's some that don't do so much. So, I don't really have an answer to your question uh, because there's still a lot of opportunities, thankfully, that um, I need to I need to learn more to, to figure out what I want to do. But I do want to do an academic environment. I think they give you the best, um, at least for me, we can be the best uh, uh, way to do research and do teaching, which is two of the common things that you know you can do in an academic institution. Um, and I think starting up an academic institution also gives you more access to resources like good mentors, um, which as you're starting off is as I've mentioned a couple of times, having good mentorship is really important. No, I think that's a great answer. It gives our students a sense of even in a single field, how many options you can have in a, in a career. Mm -hmm. um, so you've mentioned that like many people develop uh, cataracts. So these ophthalmic sur surgeries are pretty common. Um, what are some of the most common post-surgical complications that you see in people that you have to like watch out for? Yeah. So it's interesting, you know, some of the things that you see after surgery are kind of a normal response to surgery. So for example, everyone will get a little bit of inflammation in the eye. Everyone will get almost a lot of people will get a little bit of swelling, you know, in the front of the, in the cornea, uh, a little bit of swelling in the back of the eye. So most of the time that kind of goes away after a month, but the common things you can get, uh, one, if that posterior capsule is open, which happens, you know, on an average, you maybe say 1% of the time, um, that is something intraoperatively that can increase your risk of complications. Or if there's other things, because the iris is very floppy and moving around and coming to around the wounds, that's something that can make things more complicated. If someone has a very uh, myopic eye, so their glass prescription is very thick, that can increase your risk of complications as well. And then postoperatively, you know, the things you're looking for on day one, the eye pressure is often very high. And in some situations, it can be very low. So that's what one thing you have to look for. Then in the week after surgery, you know, you're making sure that the inflammation is under control. Um, that's also the time frame where you can get a very serious infection inside the eye, a post-surgical infection, which is one of the most uh, kind of 
tough things to manage and tough things for patients to go through after infection, uh, after surgery, but thankfully that's very rare. Um, and then about a month after is when you're dealing with the complications of persistent inflammation, which is, you know, maybe the cornea is still inflamed and cloudy um, and that can be limiting their vision. Sometimes uh, you can get swelling in the back of the eye and if it's persistent and again, in the center of the vision that can cause cloudiness of the vision as well. Um, so that's corneal edema and cystoid macular edema or retinal swelling. Um, I would say those are probably the most common things you, you, you were managing after surgery. After cataract surgery. So other sort of random complications. Um, one of the side effects that's been reported from the COVID-19 vaccine is uveitis. Um, do we know what causes that response? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, COVID, I actually wrote a, a something on it. Like COVID, it causes an inflammatory uh, is systemic inflammation and systemic inflammation can affect the eye. Um, so, you know, after you get COVID, there's been reports. The one I wrote up is something called idiopathic orbital inflammatory syndrome, where it's essentially a kid who had COVID. And then in the week or so after his eye, his eyelids and eye muscles became very swollen and irritated. He was having double vision. He had trouble seeing. Um, and, you know, post-viral illnesses are actually not uncommon. You can get post-viral inflammation from other viruses. Like if you get a flu or an adenovirus or like a pink eye, even can cause some post-viral complications. And then, you know, the, the vaccine as well uh, has been reported to, to cause that similar type of inflammation. And, you know, the vaccine does stimulate your inflammatory response. That's how it's supposed to work. Um, and those kind of inflammatory responses inside the eye can include uveitis, as you were saying, which can cause inflammation inside the eye, can cause swelling to the back of the eye. Um, those are all things that have been reported. So yeah, it's it's a unfortunately, you know, when diseases are very common, then you start to see the the side effects of them that are uncommon, but you still see them more. You know, we say in medicine often, what you see from diseases, the most common thing is you see common presentations of common diseases. Then the next most common thing is uncommon presentations of common diseases. And then you see common presentations of rare diseases. So, you know, things like diabetes or COVID or things that just millions of people have, you're going to see all kinds of stuff associated with it. Um, that even though they're relatively uncommon, show up just because the disease itself is so common. So the last question we have that we always finish with, um, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but could you kind of give an overview of what the work-life balance and ophthalmology is like? Yeah, yeah. I think it's important to um, think about that. And it, it takes a lot of work to maintain your work-life balance, um, even in a field like ophthalmology, which I think compared to other medical specialties where you, you know, maybe more weekends and more nights and things, you can still get very busy. And if you spend a lot of time doing work, you can get stuck too much on the work side of the work-life balance. So maintaining a work-life balance is part of it is picking a career that allows you to do it, but a big part of it is also making it an emphasis, um, which is why I'm glad you're asking that. Like you, you have to think about that ahead of time. Um, like, oh, this is like, I'm going to keep going to the gym. I'm going to keep eating healthy. I'm going to keep making sure I'm sleeping properly and all those things because your job <clears throat> No one's like, no one wants you to be unhealthy, but no one also is going to be looking out to make sure that you're doing that. I mean, some people are, but the job itself isn't, doesn't care. Um, so I, I think that is one of the strengths of ophthalmology. You know, it's an outpatient-based field. You you work mostly during the day. You don't have to work a lot at night. You know, in training, that's not necessarily true because you do have to cover night shifts and calls in the hospital and everything. Um, but you, you, it is a field that allows for work-life balance, but again, you have to make that effort yourself too. All right. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you giving up your time on a Saturday to talk to us. And this has been a great session. We always love when we get to see like real patient videos. Um, I invite everyone to give a warm thank you in the chat. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm going to put my email here in the chat. I know you may send it out, um, but just if everyone has other questions, feel free to email me. Yes, thank you, Dr. Um, Tarek. Um, so the link to the quiz for the session is now live and you'll need a 70% or higher to pass and receive certification. Uh, let me send that link in the chat now. <clears throat> now on to our next session dates. Our next session will be next Saturday, July 22nd at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with the physician mentoring us in internal medicine. So thank you so much to everyone for attending today's session, and we hope to see you in upcoming sessions as well. This concludes this week's shadowing. Thank you.